and I never, I, I'm never um, do this right because it. I'll hear myself in the background, but it's all good. Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to the Mike Lee Aspire session today. I am Mary Cheney. I uh, am the CEO of Minorities in Cybersecurity and Mike Talent Solutions, which is sponsoring this today. Today, I have a wonderful guest uh, on the mic with us today. We have Mr. Ken Underhill. Well, we're just going to have a chit chat about several different things. I'm going to allow him to introduce himself before I start peppering him with questions. But Ken is Ken is a friend of Mike and has been a friend of Mike for for a while now. And um, I'm going to let you you chit chat and and talk about yourself before we just have a conversation. Yeah, pressure's on now. Uh, thanks yeah. for having me, Mary. Um, up until recently, because I recently exited, but I was running a cybersecurity training company called CyberLife. And a lot of people also, I had a TV show with that as well. Um, for context, I've been in IT and cyber for a long time, worked a variety of different roles, um, including at the leadership level. So hopefully I can share some wisdom today. I've got degrees and certs and all the stuff everyone claims you need to get into the industry, but I had none of that when I started out. So I, I'm a firm believer that you don't need to take out a second mortgage to start your cybersecurity career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know what? Let's start then. Let's let's start with the origin story. So the first question is, what is your cybersecurity origin story? So I came from the traditional uh, IT background. I was doing networking prior to moving into cyber, but I guess untraditionally prior to that, I did some military time. I also worked as a pediatric nurse for a while. And prior to that, I was just a poor kid working at Burger King. So that's kind of the, the <laughs> short version of Ken in a nutshell. The short version or the long version. So what kind of network security were you doing? Uh, so, I mean, I, I was um, Jack or Jane of all trades, depending on how people gender identify, but I was the Jack of all trades, if you will. So I was doing uh, network engineering. And with that, I was having to do network security. I was having to do a lot of IAM, of course, um, I was having to do some pen testing. Uh, it was kind of one of those jobs where like, hey, we need to this, have this thing done, but we don't want to spend any money on it, which is most organizations, especially smaller ones. Who wants to do it? I was like, sure, right? Because, I, you know, of course, when you're when you're starting out in things, you, you always think that like, if I do the next thing, I'm going to get a raise. I'm here to tell you that doesn't work usually, right? You, but you can you can learn and then you can go elsewhere and get that raise that you've been trying to get. So yeah, typically just because you volunteer for stuff and I should have learned, right? In the military, you learn not to volunteer for anything whatsoever, but I didn't learn my lesson in the military and here I translated that to civilian life and I didn't learn it here either. So that's my so, background okay. in a nutshell. Okay, so let's talk about your journey, right? So you 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 just mentioned that you trans transitioned out of uh, Cyber Life TV and, and and all of that, but you know we we can we can talk about the book. We will talk about the book, and we'll talk about interviewing and things of that nature. But you know when we're talking to aspirers, our audience, of course, of course, are those that are looking to get in the space, and all of them think that they're supposed to do all the things. Um, in order to get in the space. So, you know, you, your traditional backgrounds from IT into cybersecurity, that that was that background. And then, you know, what made you transition from, you know, what you were doing on a day to day to your first, uh, your entrepreneurial journey in regards to CyberLife TV and things of that nature? So really the, the entrepreneur stuff started, um, the, the, the mindset, I mean, the mindset started as a kid, you know, you poor kid is for those that don't know me, very, very poor, um, very little food, that sort of thing. So you just kind of learned to hustle back in the day. Um, so the very first business ever was a lawn mowing business. I didn't realize what people charge. I charged way less because I didn't understand my value back then. So I was charging people $5. These days, it's like, what is that? Even back in the 90s, $5 was not a lot of money. But I was charging that. So, of course, when the people asked me the price and I was like five bucks, of course, everybody wanted me to mow their lawn um, and they never cleaned their lawn. So there's trash everywhere and stuff like that. Anyways, that was the very first kind of venture, if you will. I spent all the money on candy bars and Burger King. And, uh, <laughs> and so it is what it is. Right. So I didn't understand the financial stuff being a poor kid. Um, mm -hmm. All of you nowadays have a lot more opportunity. Right. The World Wide Web is here. It's got a ton of information for free. Um, back when Mary and I were young people. 
they didn't have all this stuff, right? Even though we're both just 22, we're going to say that now. Um, but anyway, so, so, you know, I think, um, you know, that, that kind of started, I got laid off when I was a nurse one time, I came in on a Friday to pick up my paycheck. And because I was friends with the office staff, they, they weren't supposed to tell me till Monday that, Hey, the company's closing down essentially. Uh, but they told me early so I could spend the weekend working on my resume, finding a new job, that sort of stuff. Um, which kind of leads us into later conversations. I think we'll probably talk about networking, but we'll talk about the power of networking and, and I'll talk about it as a nurse and also in cyber. So anyways, the entrepreneur stuff with um, cyber life is just more of um, this, but I've had other tech companies, but this one in particular actually started around the television show, which I had, I had a cybersecurity television show, um, grew that from initially an audience of like 10,000 a month to a couple million a month globally. Sounds really good. But if you take it in context of that, I already have a lot of people that knew me. It's a lot easier to grow things when people know you versus someone brand new starting out. So I'll say that you don't need a business with, with a client base of like 2 million plus people. You, you just need to niche down for, for, so taking a step back for anyone that's looking to start a business at some point, you need to really niche down into something, be the best at that thing. And then you can grow from there and expand from there. The pro biggest problem, even in your cyber career is people want to do everything. So you mentioned, Hey, I got to learn everything. No, you don't. There's idiots on social media talking about, you need a PhD in cybersecurity to start. What the heck? I don't know if I'm allowed to curse, so I'm going to try not to curse on here. But what the heck, it's right? Okay. Like, like, it's like okay. honestly, what, that doesn't make any sense, right? A PhD takes, what, like eight years or plus of, of education. I don't have a PhD. I know Mary's got a bunch of degrees. She's an attorney. She'll sue you if you mess with her. But you don't need that, right? I'm here to tell you, you don't need certifications. Now, those can help a little bit. You don't need a college degree. Again, that can help a little bit if, if you've got the budget for it. You certainly don't need a PhD. Like if you've got a PhD, for me, that's a red flag. Even if you have a <laughs> master's in cybersecurity, if you've already got one, too late. But if you're looking at, if you're looking at it like, hey, I've got a PhD, or I've got a um, bachelor's in psychology, for example, and I need to get a master's in cybersecurity to get a job. No, you don't. You have transferable skills already. The the more you, there's a certain point where you educate yourself too much. This is my opinion as a hiring manager. I know. People on social media are going to be screaming right now. You're wrong. You're an idiot. That's fine. I don't care. Send it to the, send your complaints to the invisible email address. I constantly post on LinkedIn, but anyways, you don't need all that stuff. What you do mm -hmm. need to do is you need to figure out your transferable skills from wherever you are right now into whatever job you want in cyber. Cause cybersecurity is vast. You got to pick a single job. So starting out picks one thing and determine, tell yourself you're going to be the best at that thing in cybersecurity. So if you want to be a SOC analyst, okay, cool. A lot of people trying to do that. So not the best choice. Um, but if you choose that SOC analyst, cybersecurity analyst, okay, cool. Focus on learning the stuff you need for that job. Not the stuff to be an engineer, not the stuff to be a pen tester, not the stuff to be focused on GRC as your first job. You need to focus on what do I need to go from zero to hero in the short, shortest period of time to get my first job. Mm -hmm. that's that's got that laser focus a lot of people don't yeah. do right because you know i mean mm -hmm. you, you see this mary even with people that that uh, you mentor as part of the mic stuff they're trying to learn everything because some idiot on social media said oh you got to learn this thing no you don't you literally mm -hmm. there's there's actually a small amount of stuff you need to learn for a particular job role to get the first job then you can mm -hmm. worry about college degrees certifications all that because a lot of companies will have an education budget that you can get you know reimbursed for different things but i i I'll talk real quick on the search stuff. If you grew up poor like me, and again, I had a little bit of money when I went into IT because I had all the other work I've done over the years. But if you're totally broke right now and you're like, oh my gosh, Sally on social media said I need a certification or Mary said I got to get a PhD. Mm -hmm. What you really need to do to, to get that certification is just buy like a $10 course on Udemy and say you're studying for that certification on your resume and on LinkedIn, so you get past the, the uh, applicant tracking system or ATS filters. That's all you need. You don't need to hold the cert because when you get in for the interview, I'm going to ask you like, oh, where are you at in the studies? Are you almost there? Or what? And you'd be like, oh, I'm halfway through, whatever. Who cares if that's BS? I don't care. I'm telling you to lie right now in the interview. Be like, yeah, I'm halfway through. But that way they'll give you time usually in your day to day. Like they'll say, hey, you know, take an hour on a Friday, study for the cert because we need to get it done by you know, the state, or you can be honest with them. Like, look, I, you know, I'm studying for it right now, but I'm trying to save up so I can pay for the exam voucher. Most hiring managers, unless they're jerks are going to be like, okay, cool. We got some budget for that. 
we're going to pay for it for you. Do you think you mm-hmm. can get it done in the first 90 days while you're here? If, mm-hmm. you know, we give you some time. So all these things that people tell you on social media that are barriers to entry, that's complete BS. You don't mm-hmm. need all that stuff to get your first job. Now, mm-hmm. the two things you need to do, well, a couple things you need to do. Um, number one, uh, thanks for that comment, Tiana. Um, but so Tiana, for those that are just listening to this, she says, you're giving me so much hope. Right. There's so much BS out there. And and we just, we could go for hours marrying all the BS out there, but here's what you need to do. You need to focus on your LinkedIn, what we call personal branding. Um, I did a post, it might've been today or, or yesterday or something on uh, my book list for 2024. I added some books to that. One of the books to that is what a lot of you might've read as a child. I don't know if kids read these days and probably just listen to books. I don't know. I, I'm old school. I buy a lot of books. My wife will tell you that I've got a lot of um, books around the house. But anyways, there's a book called The Giving Tree. Now there's a couple of lessons I posted about and I'll just share them here in case you don't want, if you're in case you're lazy and you don't want to look it up on LinkedIn. But one of the key lessons there is be giving. That's the way to network, hands down. Come in with a giving mindset because everybody else comes in with a taking mindset. So when you're talking to someone like Mary or myself or someone that you look at, at, you maybe don't look up to, but you look at like, hey, that person's more senior level than me. They probably know a lot of things. The biggest turnoff is someone that comes immediately demanding things. Like, oh, I need a job. Help, help, gimme, gimme, gimme. You're going right on my block list 100% of the time. Straight to the block list. There's special music list that plays at the block party. I don't know what it is, but when I block you, you'll figure out what that is. So I'll come in with a giving mindset. Now, the other lesson from that book, though, is like, don't give too much, right? That tree gave everything until that that greedy little boy finally came as an old man and sat on the tree stump, right? That's all that was left. You've got to set boundaries when you're giving. So for example, if you're, if you're networking with, well, I'm not a jerk. I don't think I am. But let's pretend that I'm a jerk. Right. So you, you look, you, you're like, Hey, this, this guy's senior in cybersecurity. Let me reach out to him, connect with him, whatever. And then I try to have you do a bunch of free projects for me. Set some boundaries. No, right. No, mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not gonna do free work for you. Right. That's silly. Right. Now, if you got like one cool project idea, you got something like, for example, if it's Mary and she's like, Hey, you can help on this and I'll give you a recommendation or something. Okay, cool. Right. There's an exchange there. Exchange doesn't always have to be money. It can be value. So you need to set boundaries. So that's the two lessons from that particular book, which segues into my conversation about networking, which again, come in with a giving mindset. And then going back to what I mentioned about clarity of the single thing you want to do in cybersecurity, the single career path you want to pursue, you need to network with people like that are actually doing that or have done that. You shouldn't try to get it 10,000 requests. I mean, I think I've got like 40,000 followers or something now. You, yes, you can follow Ken. I do post a lot of interesting things people tell me, but if you're trying to like get a pen testing job right now, I haven't done a pen test in years, to be honest with you, right? Like I, it's not something I've done in several years, aside from just, you know, hacking things around the house or whatever, but like to do an actual corporate pen test, I haven't done that in a few years. So I'm not the right person to give you like, to necessarily give you career advice on what people are using right now in industry for that particular niche. I got a lot of people I can reach out to. Literally, I could text somebody right now and be like, dude, what's, you know, what are people using? And they'll tell me exactly what tools they're using at the advanced level because this person's very advanced. They do more forward kind of pen testing for the US government. But like, I, if you're asking Ken, like, what tools should I learn? I mean, I'm going to be like, learn the tools in Kali Linux. That's all I can tell you. But there's probably other cool things, you know, and I'll tell you also the exploit pack um, from, I think his name's Juan that is a developer on that. But anyways, there's some things I'll tell you, but I'm not going to know everything, right? So what I'm getting at is I'm not necessarily the right person for you to start out networking with, especially for specific career advice for you, because I don't, I mean, I can give you general career advice, but I don't know exactly what in that niche you're trying to go into. I may not know exactly what people are using in that niche. So I may not know the tools to tell you to, to, to learn. In any event, I long winded answer, I think maybe to your question or what we're trying to do here, but Networking is critical. Um, Honestly, networking in anything in life, I mentioned the nursing thing, and I'll bring that up real quick. When I got laid off, because I had a network, I had a job Monday morning. I literally just had to go in to sign paperwork. So I didn't even have an interview for the job. I literally just went in and had another nursing job Monday morning. And I was, you know, good to go at that point, right? So the networking thing is so powerful. I'll give a recent, um, I think I have a recent example. Yeah, there, yeah. So um, a recent example, and I don't know that it's led to 
positions yet. But someone reached out like, hey, I got laid off. And this is an experienced person, so it's a little different. Um, but it, the same concept applies. Because they've networked with me over the years and built that relationship and they've given to people. And, and by the way, kissing butt to me doesn't work. I observe people and and based on what I see them doing and how they're giving back and what they're doing, um, learning wise, et cetera, I'll feel comfortable stamping my brand on somebody and, and making that introduction. If you ask me for an introduction, um, again, block party, you can let Mary know what the playlist is. I don't know what it is, but if you're, if I, if you, now that's not saying don't reach out to Ken, right? I'm not an asshole, but if you reach out to me, like, Hey, I want an introduction to so-and-so that I'll give you an example. So there's a young woman in cybersecurity. I won't say her name, but she's originally from Nigeria and uh, she's here in the U.S. She was doing her master's degree, she finished her graduate degree. I think her graduate degree. Anyways, she wanted to stay here in the U.S. So she needed a letter written to Homeland Security to basically petition for her visa. Um, we called it a green card back in the day. Somebody will probably take offense to that. But I don't know. I don't know what it looks like now. I think it was used to be green color, like whatever. Anyways, you can send me hate mail again to the invis invisible email address. But getting back to her situation, she asked for the letter for me to write the letter for her, which hands down I did, right? She had built a relationship over a couple of years. She had always given back. She She's actually one of the few people that ever has checked in on me. You know, a lot of people take, very few people give. That's why if you give, you stand out from everybody else. And so anyways, I wrote the letter and I took my time on it, which I'm a busy guy, especially at that point. That was um, pre-exit. So I was very, very busy, but I took the time out to write it, send it to her. Like, how's it look? She's like, can it also say this? I of course. And I did all this in a period of a couple of days. She sent it off. I didn't know what happened with that. Um, she reached out. I think it took maybe a month or two for her to get the response. But of course, they approved it. Right. Um, because with the letters like that, for anyone that has to write one, you need to make it about U.S. national security and how that person can contribute. So then what happened is I, I think I did a post or something mentioning like, hey, you know, great. She did this. Then some random dude reaches out. And I don't know who the hell this guy is. He's like, hey, I need a letter written for, you know, th same situation, right? I'm like, I don't I don't write letters for people I don't know, right? And so they, so the dude blocked me, whatever. I don't care. Block me. I don't care. Um, but getting to that, my point here is that networking needs to be, again, that giving mindset. When you do it that way, people feel comfortable stamping their brand on you. So the recent example, someone got laid off. They're trying to find a new job. I'm very good friends with the CEO of a company. And I say, hey, let me do an intro on LinkedIn. Actually, I did it for a couple of companies, I believe, um, of the senior leadership, right? And by the way, just like shit rolls downhill, networking rolls downhill, right? So if, if you get the right person like Mary or myself or, or whomever, you build that real relationship, we can literally reach out to people you can never talk to. You will never get a response from them. We can, but we can send an email or we can send a message and they will like get on a call with you or they'll introduce you to the HR person on their team. I mean, that's how, when we talk about networking, that's the real power behind networking because 99.9% .9 of cybersecurity jobs are never posted on a job platform like LinkedIn, Indeed, Monster, any of these things. They are not there. You find out about them because Ken talks to Mary and Mary says, I need a good SOC analyst. Do you know anyone? And um, I think it was Tiana that left a good comment in the chat. So I'm going to pick on her. Tiana had had built a relationship with Ken on LinkedIn over a couple of months and said she's looking for a SOC analyst role. And now I connect Tiana and Mary. And all of a sudden, Tiana has been trying for like six months to get a job. Because I stamped my brand on Tiana and say she's good. She's got an interview with Mary, the CEO of the company or the hiring manager or whatever. And unless she totally screws up that interview, she's much more likely to get hired, right? That's when we talk about networking, that's what it is. It's not getting 10,000 social media followers. That's useless. I mean, if I just look at my metrics, right? Yeah, I've got some posts to get, you know, anywhere from 3,000 to like, I think the biggest was a couple hundred thousand one time or something. And I felt special, whatever. I don't care about that met metric stuff, honestly. I, I really don't. Uh, but I've got other posts to get a hundred views, right? But I've got like, I think it's, I think I'm just shy of 40,000 or something followers. Anyways, there's a lot of people in my network, right. That follow me. I think I've got, I don't know, 20, 15, 20,000 connections, but even with me, just because I've got a massive network doesn't mean that like posts get a lot of you, right. It doesn't mean, you know, like I've never focused on that stuff. That's vanity, vanity metrics, as we call them. I focus on building relationships so I can literally pick up the phone and call 
or message an executive at the biggest tech companies in the world and they will answer my call right or they'll answer my tech or their the, my text or they'll answer my linkedin or they'll answer my email that's the power of networking i want and i'm not saying you got to network like the big way you know with the big wigs but you you've got to network with the right people and do it properly because then they can open up all those doors for you that you didn't even know existed right it's like how you know um like I know how to act right, right? Like if I'm in a room with like billionaires, I know how to act right. I don't treat them any different than anybody else, right? I'm not starstruck. You know, I've got friends that are NFL players that are celebrities. I don't, I'm not starstruck, right? So I know how to act right is what we, what Mary and I called it back in the day, right? You, I don't know what you young kids call it, but you know how to act right, right? Because I know how to act right, I can get in rooms that people don't even know exist, right? I can, I can open doors that you didn't even know existed, I can connect you with people that you you don't even know their name because they don't they don't use social media like my friends in the NFL they're not on social media they don't use it at all they, um, one's got a Facebook he rarely uses but most people but you know they do it via text like in fact um, uh, never mind I won't I won't say that because then people know who he is but um, but anyways okay wait wait okay so back up back up back up again. You, oh, you I said a are, lot, Mary. Back me up. You no. did, <laughs> yes, you did, and a lot of richness here. Um, but I really want to draw on the string about reaching out appropriately, right? And what I mean by that is that, of course, you guys, you know, if you don't know, I have an apprenticeship program in Mike's Talent Solutions, and and so we have, I have, they're all being trained as cybersecurity analysts. Yes, as SOC 1 analyst, that's fine. We'll be okay. But when someone reaches out on LinkedIn, right, there, there are certain things that will get you on the block list and, and, and there are certain things that won't. And what I'm finding for those out there that are listening, that are looking to get in the space, how about some pointers on the do's and don'ts of re cold reaching out to someone? Yeah. So don'ts is any gimme, gimme, gimme type of mentality, right? I need a job. I need help, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, do's are something as simple as would be good to connect. So they know you're a human. Now, I think the free version of LinkedIn limits to like five messages a month or something. Now they changed it. You used to be able to send uh, a message with the connection request. So with that limitation, if it's, I think it's for free accounts, because I use a free account, by the way, I don't pay for LinkedIn's not getting my money. Right. So I, I, I don't pay them. So I use a free account. I think it's like five year limited now. And maybe that's based on how many followers, whatever. Anyways, you only got a, a small amount of messages you can personalize. So be strategic with those. Um, definitely have a profile photo. Like if you don't have a profile photo, like I think I've got 5,000 connection requests sitting in my queue it's not happening. If your profile photo looks sketchy at all, if your profile looks sketchy at all, like I think you're a threat actor and you're, you're going to sit in there for a long time. Right. So the message, at least you, um, at least you let, you let them sit. I just ignore it and move it up, move along. Well, I, you, you know, I used to do that, Mary, but they send it again. I'm like, you know what? No. Uh -uh. So um, <laughs> if you set it in there, they can't send you another one anyways. Um, <laughs> so that's the way, right. So like would be good connect something that where they know that you're human, but you're not asking for something right up front. Um, if you send a personalized message, you could like, Hey, I liked your post you did about whatever, right. You know, um, would be good to connect again. Keep it like, it's just like dating, right? I mean, I don't know how people date these days. I think walking dates, Netflix and chill. That's not dating, right? Like if he's not, it, so I speak on heterosexual relationships real quick. If he's not spending any money on you, if he's not investing in you, why are you wasting time with him? Right. So there's some dating and free dating advice for you out there. Stop dating the dusties. Get a quality dude that's going to invest some money in you. Anyways, but my point here is with the dating scene, like you don't just walk up, I mean, these days, but anyways, back in the day, you just didn't walk up to someone like, pulled on your pants, let's get it on right now, right? Like that, you're going to get a rape charge, you're going to, you know, something, right? Someone's going to call the police. These days, I don't know how people do it, um, so I can't comment on that. But back in the day, like you're going to get some jail time probably, right? At least a stern talk to from the police on that stuff. In the same way, if you just send a message like gimme, gimme, gimme on LinkedIn, it's, it's the exact same thing, right? If you look at LinkedIn and it not, by the way, for all the weird dudes out there, I'm not saying like send weird messages on LinkedIn. It's not a dating service. But if you if you just equate LinkedIn to dating in the concept of you need to send the appropriate first message or the first signal, 
That's what I'm talking about. I am not telling you to harass women on LinkedIn because I've got so many horror stories from women, women in industry, from all these weirdos out there. I'm not saying to do that. I'm saying that you need to approach people the right way, right? We talked about approaching people the right way. So that's what you need to do with the messaging on LinkedIn. It's just a casual conversation up front. Same with the, if you were at a conference, when you're approaching someone at a conference, you shouldn't be like, gimme, gimme, gimme. I got a million questions to ask you because I'm going to walk right away from you and go hang with Mary, right? And then I'm going to be like, Mary, file a restraining order against this person for me. You know, she's an attorney. So what you want to do at a conference also is just, hey, how's it going? I see you know, we're connected on LinkedIn or I see you're on LinkedIn a lot, you know, um, and even there, right? At a conference, you can send a connection request. If you didn't get, if you didn't get a, someone accepting it, if you see them at a conference, like, hey, I just want to connect, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, hey, I can't, sent you a connect request a while back. You probably get a lot. Someone like me, I'm going to go through my list of 5,000 and search for your name, possibly, depending on how, you know, I think I can query that. Um, but in any event, like, I'll, I think I can, I'll just search your name, right? I'll find you and I'll send you a connection request, right? Like that, but that's where it starts at, Mary. It's, it starts with the, just a very non-threatening type of message, but also showing that you're a human if you can send a personalized one. But if you can't, like if you're out of those requests for the month or whatever, you can't send a personalized note, then before you send that connection request, make sure your profile doesn't look ghetto. Make sure that it looks like it's a real person and that you're in cybersecurity and, you know, and it's not a picture of you partying on a weekend or something like a professional photo, because all those little things matter when I'm, when I'm dealing with like 5,000 requests, right? I'm going to get hundreds of them a day. If anything is off about the profile at all, I'd leave it be and I move on to the next one that looks normal or that somebody sent me a message or whatever on. So that's kind of the, the, the gist of either reaching out in person or on social media with people. It's just not being creepy, essentially. I know that's hard for some of you probably listening, but not being creepy and just sending like a very non-threatening type of connection request or messaging to that other person. And I want I want to draw on the brand thing because I think that um, individuals don't understand from the from the moment you reach out to someone at the executive level, if you're reaching out to the CEO about something, uh, if you're reaching out to Mary or Ken about something and you don't present yourself to be a professional or you say something, you, you, you draw back into slang language. I had that happen this week. It, it, it says less of, it, it diminishes your brand when you are actually reaching out to somebody and you're using slang terminology or you have grammatical errors or things like that. And so, you know, understanding even at that cold reach out, you, you are being, it, it's a matter of, I have, five seconds to figure out if I'm going to say yes or no. And I automatically say yes to anybody in business development, <laughs> anybody with the sales. Yep. Mm -hmm. 100%. <laughs> anything, anything, <laughs> anything with, I work for a training company. Nope. I don't want your certs. I don't want your cert training. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any of that stuff. No, I think you bring up a good point there, you know, professional communication. And so these days, I think the advantage is you could do something for free, like chat GPT to give you ideas of how, you know, I, I want to, reach out to, I mean, by the way, I wouldn't send a bunch of connect requests to like CEOs and stuff because I don't want to say you're not at, the, this is going to sound bad. You're, you're, you're not at the though. level, but, it, but, it, but, it, but I'm not saying that like, you're not worthy. Right. Like, I mean, I was, I was, I didn't have the mindset at the time when I worked at like Burger King and stuff, but the way I treated people was a millionaire mindset already. So as I went through life, millionaires, billionaires, stuff like that. They feel comfortable with me. Celebrities that all of you would like, can you give me their autograph? They feel comfortable with me because my mindset is, is professional. Like I said earlier, right? I know how to act right. And so if you don't know how to act right, if you're, you know, I mean, we all grew up there. I mean, sometimes I talk ghetto, right? Because I've been, I've had different experiences than someone that came from like a two parent home and grew up in the, you know, white picket fence neighborhood and whatever. Right or parents pay for college, all that stuff. I didn't have all that. So I speak differently when I'm relaxed, but I learned over the years to speak a certain way in my professional communication because corporate America is corporate America. You got to act a certain way. You got to dress a certain way. If you follow, it's just, it's a game. Just like football, basketball, whatever. If you learned, like if I, if I play football 
Well, you know what? Better example, basketball. If I if I go play basketball and I keep shooting the basket or the, the ball into the opposing team's hoop for them, what the heck, right? Like, I obviously don't, I don't know, but, you know, I'm doing the game wrong because now we're losing because it's like, oh, okay, cool. We'll take that point, right? That's cool. We love when Ken plays because he, you know, he scores all the, he scores 100 points for our team, right? It's the same way here, right? Corporate America is a game. Yeah, there's, you know, there there's, um, there's things working against you, especially if you're a minority, right? But at the end of the day, it's a game. If you learn to play the game, you can boom, right? Now you're at the top, right? It takes time, a lot of hard work. But you can be at the top making millions for a big tech company or whatever, and you never need to start your own business because you're making, you know, you're making bank over there. But you got to learn the game. And so with that, the professional communication aspect, I mean, I would just use something like ChatGPT if you don't know how to talk right. Now, when you... Um, I did a podcast with, um, forgive me if I get your name wrong. I think it was Andrew Wilder. Um, but anyways, we talked about executive presence, you know, and EQ and stuff like that. And if you don't know what the heck any of that stuff is, just go search my name on YouTube and find that episode. And also for personal branding stuff, I've got free videos on LinkedIn, your resume, where I walk through people's resumes and talk about that stuff. Just go look at that. It's free. Yeah. You got to invest in time. I know people want 20 second videos on TikTok or whatever. I don't do TikTok. So I talk a minute in those videos, like it's like 20, 30 minute video on like, I think the LinkedIn walkthrough, but I'm dropping, I, I'm biased, but I'm dropping, dropping nuggets of gold. At least I think I am. And people have told me, oh, this is great. So invest some time to go look at that stuff. Cause you can literally spend, here's the thing I learned early on in tech. People are lazy as hell. So if you are willing to learn, whether it's through a book, a YouTube video, a course, whatever, if you're willing to like grind it out and skip Netflix for a day and just grind stuff out, man, you're going to propel yourself in your career much faster than everybody else because people are lazy as hell. And this is this goes across any career field. It's not just cybersecurity or IT. People are lazy as hell everywhere. Doctors are lazy as hell, right? The, the doctors that like people are like, oh, they're making a lot of money and they're the best because they constantly learn. But you don't talk about that doctor that got the C in medical school. Because they're a lazy ass. Well, they're, maybe they're not a lazy ass. Maybe it was difficult, whatever, right? Some people are bad test takers. But like, let's be real here, right? If you graduate top of your class at anything, you put in the work. You didn't get there just by showing up, right? Um, I mean, for the most part. There's one-offs that we won't talk about on here because we're not going down that path. But but that's what I'm getting at here, right? Like you, you can propel yourself a lot just by digging in your heels and constantly learning. I mean, I, I'm always learning new things. I buy, like I said, I buy books all the time. Uh, I buy courses. I mean, I'm I'm one of those people that's got like 400 courses on Udemy I've never gone through. But at some point in the future, I may go through those, whatever, when I retire, who knows. But the point is, you know, if, you, if you're willing to put in the work and um, as someone just mentioned, Tiana just mentioned in the chat, the jargon, right? Like learn, you don't have to spend thousands of courses to learn industry jargon. It could just be something as simple as consuming some, some podcast episodes, just dedicating. It's just about planning, right? People talk about they don't have time. Yes, you do. There's um, I'm a Star Trek fan. So way back in the 90s, there was a movie called Star Trek Gen Generations where they um, mixed the old Star Trek and the Star Trek The Next Generation cast. In that, um, I think it was Scotty. Scotty and Captain Kirk were having a conversation about uh, Sulu, who was another character from the original episodes. And they were talking about, you know, when did he have the time to, to build a family? And Scotty, I think it was Scotty that said it to Captain Kirk, um, was like, like you say, like you always say, if it's important, you'll make the time. In the same way in your cybersecurity career, if it's important to you to actually get a cybersecurity job, you're going to put in the time. You're going to be like, um, actually, Andrew and I talked about this. Uh, he brought it up on the podcast episode I'm talking about. He said, um, one of his early mentors said, what are you willing to give up for your goals? All of us have made sacrifice. Like you sit, you sit here watching me right now, like, oh, that's a nice suit. Thank you, by the way. But it took time to get here, right? Like I sacrificed. I mean, I was putting in 18, 20 hour days for years. And I know for some of you, you have children. My philosophy, I don't have kids, but my philosophy uh, having a pediatric nursing background is give them a fire extinguisher, some band-aids, a little bit of food and tell them you're on your own for a couple hours while mom does this stuff, right? So if you're a single mom out there, try that method, see what happens. Um, if CPS comes, don't blame me. But but you know, getting um, back to the hard me, work. Excuse right? me, as as a single mother, I would suggest you do a little bit more than that. Um. <laughs> you know, it is what it is. You know, everyone has a different opinion, but that's good enough to get them. Yeah, if, if, give give them a phone anything, to call nine one one. You just have to. 
you just have to get up before they get up and put in the work before. And, that, and that's, that's what it is, right? You know, I, I know someone that, um, you know, she's got a couple of kids and she was trying to do her graduate degree, but she still did it, right? But then there's people on social media that complain they don't have the time to take a two hour course to learn this thing. They want you to like summarize it in five minutes for them. So, all of you out there are adults watching this. Even if you're not, I'll consider you an adult for the purposes of, of this thing I'm about to say. You're an adult. You're you're responsible for yourself. And if you look at yourself as a business, you know you're the business of you. So, I like to ha I like to tell people that mindset because, yes, you're learning and the sacrifice, all this stuff. That's one part of the the business. You know, to, to grow the business to make the business more valuable. But at the same time, when you get in like salary and compensation negotiations, you need to understand your worth as a business, so you negotiate properly and get your worth, instead of being like, well. I don't want them to think I'm, you know, I'm too expensive or whatever. Nah, forget that. Any any compensation you get, that company has already planned out. They're going to get at least a 10x on you every single year. So whatever you're getting, just know if it's a lot more money, if you're like, I want that 200 grand base salary. Okay, we're going to make 2 million off of you this year, right? And every single year, every time you get a raise, it's a 10x. That's how a business owner thinks. If, if they're really good, they'll think 20x, 30x. How can I just kill this person with work to make them to get so much productivity out of them. I could just make millions of dollars and retire on the beach while they're doing the work in corporate for me. So that's a mindset of a business owner. You need to have that in your own life of everything you do. Another thing I want to talk about, and Andrew and I talked about this on the podcast as well. So you might as well just go listen to the episode. I think it's like 45 minutes. It's a little long, but we just both drop nuggets of gold. Something else for, um, Everything that all of you are going to, so all of your day-to-day -day stuff, whatever you want to do should determine the decisions for your life. What the hell is Ken talking about? Let me explain it. So let's say that you want to be a CISO one day, or you think maybe you do. You want to be an executive in cyber one day. You may change that over time, whatever. That's fine. Right now, in this very moment, ask yourself, okay, what would a CISO do in this situation? I'm not talking about your cyber career. I'm talking about everyday life. If you're in traffic, would a CISO be flipping people off? Well, some I know would, but for the most part, an executive has to be mature. They have to control their emotions, et cetera, right? Same thing in the grocery store. How would a CISO act? Or if you eventually want to be a millionaire one day, what would a millionaire do in this situation? Yes, there's some idiot millionaire. I mean, there, I know some. There's some idiot ghetto millionaires out there that will act stupid in public. But for the most part, the vast majority of real millionaires that have real money, not the social media people that pretend, but the real mil millionaires, they act a certain way. They control their emotions, just like an executive. They talk to people a certain way. They're very patient. They're very patient when they shop, for example. Like they don't rush in the store. I got to get all these things. They're like, let me take a moment. Even in their car before they go in a grocery store, they take a moment, get their composure. Then they go in. They speak in their mind. I even do this. I speak in my mind before I go in. It's going to be a great experience. People are going to move out of my way because I don't want to deal with screaming children. And, you know, a great experience, whatever. People are going to be friendly, whatever. Every single time in the grocery store, I don't have issues. When I didn't used to do that, way back in the day, people would slam me with cards. Oh, I didn't see you. You know, all the Karens of the world, right? So if you're dealing with Karens of the world, you can, in your mind, control that quite a bit. Um, not always perfectly, but you can do that. So anyways, the mindset all of you need to have is that level you want to get to. And I'm not talking about the first job of like SOC analyst or pen test or whatever. I'm talking about look to the future. I know it's crazy. Look to the future. Maybe 10 years out, you're like, I want to be a CISO or I want to be an executive or I want to be in management. All right. Well, how does that person act? Like literally you can look on social media and find, I mean, I'm a little goofy because I've got the business side, you know, I've got my own stuff. I can, I can, I can afford to be goofy and silly and talk trash. You can't unless you already have a you know, successful business and, you know, and money and all that stuff. So you need to look at people um, like a Mary's a good example, right? She's more serious on social media. She's, you know, very direct Her conversations, what she posts, that stuff's deliberate. There's a goal in mind, right? People like that, even Andrew, the guy I mentioned on the podcast, look him up on social media, look how they talk, how they interact with people. It's very professional. There's a certain way they do it, right? That's what you need to do if you ever want to get to the next level. But the more you act like that next level, the faster that next level comes to you is my whole spiel and lesson take or key takeaway of all the stuff I just said right now. <laughs> 
you're saying a lot. You're saying a lot. But I hope people are taking notes. I, I, well, this is this is recorded, I think. So it's on, it's yeah. out okay. there on YouTube for oh, all. Oh man, I'm in trouble uh, now. Over man. yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. Um, so um let's 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 talk about entrepreneurship because I had and in in under the guise of being someone from an underrepresented group, whether that be underrepresented. And, and because you're African American, underrepresented because you're Asian, whatever the flavor is, I had a young person that's trans. Well, well no, they're not a young person transitioning into cybersecurity and said, "Oh, well, you know, I'll just be a consultant." Do do you do you want to talk about the, the journey of entrepreneurship? If that's something that you're thinking about, what exactly it is going to entail? So for you to come like from, um, I don't know, I mean, we'll just use nursing, for example, but like if you're, if you're coming from like a nursing background and just because you want to get in cybersecurity, you're like, oh, I'm gonna be a consultant. No. Um, however, there's a caveat there. There's a caveat. No to bigger deals. However, the, so the easiest way to, to, to be an entrepreneur is, um, to basically do the services, which you mentioned consultant. And the easiest way to do that, if you're brand new to cybersecurity, this is for people coming out of college or even um, people transitioning, whatever, is to find smaller businesses that don't have a budget to hire somebody and figure out like one specific thing you could do for them. That could be a consulting call for free, whatever. You just need a couple of testimonials of people saying, Mary's a badass to then sell consulting services. Now you're not going to get an enterprise client. You're, you're not big enough. You're one person. You cannot touch an enterprise. You can't touch most, most of mid market. You, you like you, those are, those are out of the question for you. If you want to be an individual consultant starting out, just be realistic. That's not happening for you. So you're not getting multi-million dollar deals. You're not gonna be like, Oh, I'm gonna drive Ferrari tomorrow. No, you're not. You're not getting that. However, you can get a lot of smaller deals starting out at probably like 500 bucks or maybe $1,500. Get a lot of those in place with small businesses once you get a couple of reviews and then, so we're giving some free business advice here real quick. You don't have to pay a $10,000 coach for this stuff. I'm giving you, I'm giving you the game for free. So basically, right. You, 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 you get a couple of free clients and you'd be very specific and very clear on what you're doing for them. Cause people will scope Creek like, like a mofo if you don't, especially if you're not charging them. So be very specific. Like this is all I'm doing. We're going to sign a contract. And again, chat GPT, or you can find contract templates online. You don't need an attorney to do that. Um, I do recommend you do an attorney, at least to look at it. But realistically, most attorneys out there like that you would pay a couple hundred bucks for, they're just pulling a template anyways offline. I've even seen some startups that used a mega firm that the mega firm pulled like two different templates that I knew of online together and made like a whack contract that really wasn't enforceable. But they did it because it's just, you know, a couple of grand job with a startup. Anyways, I digress. The point here is that you, as an individual consultant, you need to get a couple of um, people basically for free. An easy way to do that is reach out to like nonprofit places. Like, I, I, I mean, I'm not an organized religion, but a lot of people are. So if you go to a church, con touch base with that church, that pastor, say, hey, I'm getting into cybersecurity. What I'd like to do is I'd like to do a free consult for you on kind of what, you know, the church, even if that's a physical security assessment for them, right? On some of the risk of someone coming in and, I don't know, stealing a Bible. I don't know who, who would do that, but whatever. Um, but then you say, but I want, I, I, but I needed a testimonial in ex, you know, exchange for that. So are you willing to get on a Zoom call with me and do a, you know, a, a testimonial of like what you liked about what I did for the church and, you know, how it's, you know, helped you or whatever? But all you got to do, I mean, I think you could do Zoom recordings for free still these days. That's all you got to do. But you can you could do that for other nonprofits because they don't have a budget for you. But you're just the only the thing you're doing is you're getting testimonials. And you could literally do that right now. If you've learned a little bit about cybersecurity, you can literally do something for them, even if that's talking about their social media presence and saying, hey, here's some of the tips and tricks. But you want that testimonial. That's got to be you got that got to get that in writing that they're, they're going to get the testimonial. Even if you just want to get them on a Zoom call and in that call, you say, I just want to talk about your social media and give you some tips and tricks. Literally record that, say, I, okay, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you that advice, but I'm going to record it. And then at the end of it, I'm going to ask you for a testimonial, like if you found this valuable or not, that's all you got to do. That's all you need for a testimonial. And you get a maybe three to five of those from these nonprofits for free. 
doing some very simple tasks like that, now you've got testimonials and now you start charging. Now you start reaching out to nonprofits or other companies like, hey, they don't know that it's free, right? You're not going to ask the pastor on the call like, hey, tell me what you pay. No, they don't need to know any of that. As far as they know, whatever rates you're going to charge the next company is what they paid, right? So if you start out, I would start out with like 1500 bucks for whatever you're going to do. Um, depending on what you're going to do, maybe 500 to 1500, do that for honestly, probably at least six months of getting deals. And you're honestly, you're going to make more than you would in corporate working an entry level job. And then also now, like, like every year you raise pricing. So before you raise pricing, you say, Hey, as you reach out to new clients, you say, Hey, pricing is going to raise on, you know, January 1st, it's going up to five grand. Right now, though, you can get it for fifteen hundred for these, you know, this exact service that we're doing. That's going to get you a ton of sales, and then you, you know, you'll schedule out the calls or whatever like that. But that's that's the game right there. That's what all these online gurus that have no money that their only money is from building a course or you know a coaching program to sell you on the coaching program. That's all they do. Like they don't have real money. They've never never run a real business. I'm I just gave you the game right there that they would charge you anywhere from from ten grand to five fifty thousand dollars for. You just got it for free. So hopefully you don't waste that if you were thinking about starting a business or even a side hustle. I really encourage everyone to have a side hustle like that because you don't know if you're going to get laid off tomorrow. It doesn't matter your experience or anything. You're a number on a spreadsheet to corporate America. So you may get laid off. So build a side hustle. Again, I just gave you the, I literally just gave you all the game. If you, if you take action on it, great. If you don't, I mean, that's your problem, right? I'm not, <laughs> don't reach out to me like, Hey, here's my GoFundMe. I already gave you the game, so you, you know, do your own thing. <laughs> you drop in knowledge, kid, and that's that's really, really important to understand. And also, you know, the side hustle aside and dealing with, and, and if you guys have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. If you have, if you're on YouTube, drop them in the chat on YouTube, and we'll, I'll, I'll monitor um, to see if there's there's any questions, but. And, you know, you have the entrepreneurial journey and then you have folks that are, you know, I get folks that come up to me or they'll they'll do the wrong thing, which is reach out to me about uh, our apprenticeship program. Well, how much am I going to get paid? And it becomes a. If you watch the videos on videos on YouTube, you understand that this is a non paid apprenticeship program. So until you're placed with an organization you won't be getting paid. It's about what your effort and, and what you're putting into that. Now, what I'm learning is that that's a good thing because it, it actually filters out all of the noise or the nonsense for those folks that are just watched the YouTube video that said they can be in cybersecurity in 30 days and they are looking. <laughs> well, I mean, Man. a lot of stuff... I mean, even with our apprentices in our current cohort, they they say a lot of things that is that's just not right. I, you know, I'm a Gen Xer, right? And you know, I I, I don't I'll be 52 next month, right? Yeah, 52 next month. And so for me, it takes years. I've forgotten half the stuff that that I'm teaching these apprentices, but it takes years of experience to be able to answer some of these complex questions about what's going on in your cybersecurity risk posture. But my challenge at times is I have younger generational folks that think they deserve $200,000 a year corporate salary at the SOC 1 analyst level. Yeah, good. Let me know if you find that because both Mayor and Al take that one. Um, that's not realistic, right? And I think, you know, the, it's a complex issue, right? You, first, you have the media claiming there's millions of cybersecurity jobs open, which is 100% bullshit. There are very, very few, quote unquote, entry level jobs open. What you see open are experience level. So what can you do? If someone out here watching this right now, that's like, oh my gosh, can just crush my dreams. IT has a lot of jobs in general IT, like sysadmin. You can make a couple hundred grand a year, 150 grand, 200 grand a year as a sysadmin if you've got some experience. You can start out in cloud, become a cloud architect. You could go take Adrian Cantrell's training. I think now they've got a monthly plan. It's like 30 bucks a month. I mean, come on, skip some Starbucks this month, right? And, and sign up for that stuff. You can go through that training. They've got hiring managers inside their community there. You can get a job as a cloud architect. You won't start out at hundred grand, but you can get to a hundred grand within a year. And then you can get to 200 grand in like, you know, probably three years. 
or so, three to five years. Yeah, you all are being sold a lot of bullshit, honestly, out there, right? It's the media is one side of it. You got other cybersecurity people. A lot of them work in academia. And so they're like, get a PhD, right? We talked about that earlier. Get a PhD in cybersecurity. That's the way. Bullshit. If you if you knew what you were talking about, you would be in cybersecurity, not academia. I love academia people. There's a lot of good ones that do have experience, but there are also ones that are just academics and they've never worked in IT or cybersecurity job in their life. The other thing I'm going to say around that is your career counselors at these university programs or college um, programs and even boot camps, they all mean well, but probably 99.9% .9 of them have never worked in an IT or cybersecurity job in their life. So they give you a lot of generic HR information, especially around their LinkedIn profile. Again, utter bullshit because then you look like everybody else. You need to stand out. So again, the video I mentioned earlier, go look at some of those and you should be good there. But yeah, I mean, that, so that's the, the big issue, right? Is you've got all these places that are always trying, they're always trying to sell you something. Oh, let me talk about ah, his name is Boyd or Booger or something. It starts with a B. That's the dude you're talking about where he's got a, he's got videos where like, oh, the one I love to talk about is, and it's got, it's probably got over a million views now because people want, people want to be told bullshit. Just like the online gurus, right? People want to be sold bullshit. Because they want the easy path. They want to feel like nothing in life takes hard work. To be a millionaire, it just takes 24 hours, Mary, in my course. Just pay me 10 grand. You're going to be a millionaire fucking tomorrow. Crypto is going to be the way. That, what? No, right? No. Real investing takes time. And honestly, investing is just preservation of capital. That's not the way to do it. If you, There's only two ways to, to become a... Well, there's three ways to become a millionaire in the U.S., other countries, if you're listening from another country, I, I can't help you. In the U.S., though, we got capitalism. So there's three main ways. One is you master the corporate game and you become an executive at a big company. And then you get millions in options that you can then, you know, then you're, your base isn't going to be millions usually, but you'll get millions in options. Number two is business. So your own business. Number three is real estate. So real estate investing. And, you know, and we're not going to dive into all that stuff. That'd be a whole like That'd be a whole masterclass. And I'm not going to do that for all of you. You're not, you're not at that point. But but that's the ways to become a millionaire. It's not going to happen overnight. Just like your cybersecurity career, it's not going to happen overnight. That dude's got a video where he talks about become a GRC analyst with no experience, um, no education or whatever, in 24 hours making six figures. A hundred percent. But he even admits it in the video. Because I watched the video, I'm like, I got to know this, right? Because I'm going to do this path. In the video itself, he's like, well, you won't make six figures immediately. You know, it takes some years of experience, but then the rest of the video is basically him selling you on his his damn program. Now, caveat here, his program is good if you've got a background in IT right now. His program basically teaches you DevSecOps. That's what he teaches you, to work in the DevSecOps world, and that's how he gets you, his people to... I know someone that went through his program, so it is good training in there and good mentorship and stuff in there. I think it's like a six or 12-month program, but it's not for entry-level people. If you got like three to five years or more of IT experience, then that's a good program for you. But it's not for entry level people and it's not around GRC whatsoever. I mean, he does, I think they do teach a little around that, but like, no, right? It's not, you're not going to get that. And you're definitely not going to get it in 24 hours. Like that is not happening. Nothing in cybersecurity is going to happen in 24 hours. Now, if you, if you all want to- The roadmap, hackers, the hackers will, the hackers will happen in 24 hours. But you, but you all, <laughs> I'm assuming everyone's based in the US, right? You're going to get caught in the US, right? You're going to get caught. Now, other countries, if you want to move to Russia, cool. That's great. If you want to move to North Korea, great. There's risk with that there's issues with that right but if you feel like you're a super hacker and you want to move there and then commit crimes great yeah you'll get you'll get money if you if you even the cartels down in, in mexico and in central and south america if you got good hacking skills you could go work for them there's a side effect of death but you could you know you can make good money for them however Wait a real quick real quick real quick <laughs> i want to answer tiana's question oh yeah um TCC, which is here local to me, I'm in I'm in Mansfield, Texas. That's that's right down the street. I believe that's what Tiana is. And uh, two year cybersecurity program. Will their program get me my first job? Is it worth it? TCC is a um, it, it, okay. There is nothing that's going to be able to guarantee you a job. Okay, let me explain something to you. What I know, what I've learned. 
and because I have my apprenticeship program. There are a lot of organizations, there are a lot of things going on out there about how to get into cybersecurity. One thing that is readily apparent to me over and over and over again is nobody knows where the jobs are, which is why we have our Mike Talent Challenge, which is 100 cybersecurity, entry-level cybersecurity roles in 2024. I have my own theories about exactly why there aren't any entry-level roles, mainly because back when me and Ken were in the, in, in the mix in corporate America, they outsource everything to uh, offshore. And that's why you have a whole bunch of jobs that can't be filled because you didn't invest in the entry-level roles, which is what we're doing in my talent, trying to reverse that. Um, and it, you know, we're, we're moving towards that in, in our own little way. But all that to be said, any education that you have, it will be great. If you, you know, the two-year degree at TCC, is it worth it? It all depends if you have the money. Absolutely. If you don't have the money, I think there are other options that you have. There are non-traditional pathways into this profession, especially for underrepresented groups that don't necessarily have the capital or the cash or money, all of that to, to invest in a particular program. But if the end result, the, the the end result of any of these, whether it's a boot camp, whether it's an apprenticeship, whether it's college, that's not going to guarantee you a job. What's going to guarantee you a job is is your effort in, in in getting that job and how resilient you're going to be and how ambitious are you going to be. None of nothing is going to be able to guarantee you anything if you don't if you don't put in the work. 100% agree with that. Um, one thing I like about, you know, so I talked earlier, like you don't need college degrees or certs or anything stuff, which is true. Um, a lot of community colleges have connections locally in that area with businesses. Um, I don't know that program. I don't know what they teach, whatever like that. I will say there's a program in a Northern state I know of that they have a hundred percent placement rate. Now they don't guarantee. I mean, you can, like Mary said, you can't guarantee placement unless you have a staffing company or services company on the back end, like some of these online boot camps do, and they just plug you in there. Um, but majority, if you look at like place, like actual placement rate data of boot camps and even colleges and university, community colleges and universities, the vast majority, when they talk about cybersecurity, it's not cybersecurity jobs. They're placing people into IT jobs and, and they're calling it cybersecurity, but there's only like maybe one person in a thousand that goes into like a cybersecurity engineer or analyst or SOC analyst roles or whatever. Majority go into IT jobs. So if you go with that mindset, Tiana and any others looking at any education out there, whether it's certs or college degrees, if you go in the mindset, if in in this sucks, I know this is painful. This is like Ken ripping off the band-aid slowly. But if you go in with the mindset of like, I'm open to a general IT job, maybe sysadmin, network engineer, IT help desk, technical support specialist, whatever they want to call a help desk at that particular company, you're much more likely to get a job and probably within a couple of weeks here than you are trying to get a SOC analyst job or pen test or any of these other things that are magical cybersecurity careers. And then you become it becomes much easier to get that cybersecurity job in six months or 12 months. And plus you get to pay your bills, right? That's the other thing. But uh, getting back to that program I mentioned, they've got like 100% placement rate in the, it's a two-year program. And I think it's like the first semester of year two is 100% placement rate with local companies because of the way they train them because it's a really good program. Again, I don't know the program you're looking at Tiana or any others out there, but that would be my thought process. If I was in your shoes right now, if I was looking at a program, I would start talking to, I would, I would, of course, if you're in it right now, like you're already paying for it, do it. Community college is less money, obviously. So there, there's really no difference for an entry-level type of role between a, an associate's degree and a bachelor's degree. Like there's re, like education-wise, because the bachelor's degree, first couple of years is all the, you know, little literature stuff and stuff I don't care about, right? The, all that stuff you have to go through to get a bachelor's degree. Community college, usually maybe the first year is some of that stuff or you have a mixture, but there's usually at least some kind of here I am, hands-on, technical, whatever stuff that you've done. And so I would say bang for your buck, community college is better because you can always get a bachelor's later. Like, um, you know, I did my my stuff online. You can always find an online school like Western Governors. That's really the cost. But the point I'm making here is that a lot of community colleges, they will have 80 plus percent placement rates, but those are IT jobs. So if you're open to an IT job starting out, 
That would be my recommendation for all of you on here. It would not be trying to get a quote unquote cybersecurity job because I think an IT job, even a cloud architect job is so much easier to get. It's not easy. Like Mary said, you got to work. But once you've worked at it, it's easier to get because there's so many of them open and everyone else on social media is trying to get a cybersecurity job. So if you go the opposite direction, then, you know, it is what it is, right? It's like dating. Like if I, yeah. like if I, like, let's just, you know, I'm a vertically challenged individual or some people call it short. So if I go to a, um, actually, I'll just, I'll just do it. Um, hopefully nobody, nobody gets pissed off of this, but I'm a straight guy. So if I go to a gay club with gay males, the odds of me finding a woman there that's a straight, a heterosexual woman and getting a date, pretty freaking low, right? But if I, go, if I if, I used to love to go to gay clubs. Well, but you know, it's, 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 you know, whatever. It's a I'm, just, chance, I'm right? throwing you Obviously off. I'm, I'm married right now. I don't, I don't do this stuff. But if I was a single dude, right. And I was, you know, I was trying to like make the, make the most of my efforts. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, and I'm not going to go to a club with a bunch of dudes. Right. I'm going to find a lot of women that are probably open to short guys. Right. Wherever that club is, I don't know where that's at. It probably doesn't exist, right? Because I got turned on a lot before being sure. But but wherever that club exists, right? I'm going to go there because there's a bigger pool to choose from. In the same way, the bigger pool is these IT jobs, especially around cloud and DevSecOps. That's where, and you're going to be doing security stuff, by the way. Like you're not just a cloud architect. You don't do anything security, right? You're basically working in a consultant role for clients. So you're going to be advising them on, hey, this is why we should do this stuff. So you're going to be doing security. It just doesn't say cybersecurity in the title of the job. So if you're open to that, there's a lot more jobs open is what I'm getting at. And it's going to be much easier on you to get a job. You still got to put in the work. You still got to brand yourself properly, all these things, but it's a lot easier to do it that way than it is to like the example, right? To try to go to the gay club and find the Marys of the world, right? There, 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 there's not well, a lot you know, of You know, I used to love to go to the gay clubs just because I love to dance, but that's, that's, that's well, a that and, no, and realistically, nobody's bothering that's, you that's there. It. You know, yeah, nobody's, absolutely. No, no, you know, because they're not looking absolutely for Marys, right. right? I mean, exactly. Yeah. And that's why it was always fun. So anyway, uh, I know we're at time. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful conversation. I would, I would say, um, to those of you out there, unfortunately, we do have Mike Talent Solutions has a nationally recognized registered apprenticeship program. Um, that is another vehicle by which you could get into the cybersecurity profession as, as someone looking to do so. I'm here to tell you that our applications have closed. We are, we can only take 100 and we had 100 over 150 applicants for those 100 roles. Um, and we're going through interviews right now. But Believe you me, Miss Miss Mary won't rest until I'm able to unlock the key to some of these um, cybersecurity roles. So I'm banging on doors, all those doors that me and Ken can get into that you guys can't. Believe you me, there list. I'm taking every last one of you with me when I'm there. So I would like to thank you, Mr. Underhill, for um, spending some time with us on the mic today and the Mike Lead Aspires session. Thank you so much for stepping in. Ken is also one of our instructors in our Mike Builders program. So I really, really, really appreciate you. Uh, and I want you guys out there to have a wonderful, oh, I didn't have anything on YouTube. So I want you guys to have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful weekend and you guys enjoy. Bye-bye.